Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, everybody. My name is Chris, and I am an alcoholic. Um, I want to thank Lisa for... uh, uh, talking us into doing this. We've had, we've had a great experience here. Karen, uh, for uh, for putting together half of the speakers and being here a lot more than I actually was, and I, I way appreciate that. Um, tonight, we're, we're going to be talking on Step 12, and uh, my experience with Step 12 started uh, the day I came back into Alcoholics Anonymous. This was right around, uh, right around New Year's of... Uh, of 1990, uh, the beginning of 1990. What had happened was I had taken a stab at Alcoholics Anonymous for a couple of months uh, earlier that year and ended up uh, relapsing. Uh, ended up, you know, uh, going through an absolutely horrific time, uh, being motivated out of desperation uh, to go back to Alcoholics Anonymous. <clears throat> and this time, <clears throat> I understood intuitively that I needed to give a lot more of myself this time. I needed to try a little bit harder than I had the time before. So on day two back in AA, I bumped into a person who uh, uh, who had been my contact out of rehab. Uh, I never asked him to be my sponsor, but back in the, back in the day when you went through uh, 28-day treatment, they would usually hook you up with a sponsor in the local AA area where you lived. And this guy was my sponsor. So I saw him on my second night back in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I went up to him and I said, Phil, these are are my exact words. I go, I've been in hell. I I need to get out. Uh, Will you help me? And I was incredibly desperate. And he he, he laughed. You you know how sponsors are. You come to them with these deep, horrific problems and they'll they'll like chuckle at you. And he, he laughs at me. And then he says to me, you know... I could use a new pigeon. And, you know, I had never heard that term before. I was was like a little bit horrified. He wanted me to be his pigeon. And, you know, the only pigeons I knew about were stool pigeons, you know. I figured he wanted me to to spy on the rest of his sponsees or something. But I was desperate enough to to say, okay, you know, I'll I'll be your pigeon. And really what I did was, uh, without, without fully knowing what I was doing, I placed myself... Um, under his care and protection. Because I recognized at that point that alcoholism was going to kill me, uh, that if I could do something about it myself, I probably would have done so a long time ago. And so maybe he had a better plan. Uh, supposedly he had 10 years sober, and, you know, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't, I, I'd run out of plans. I, I knew trying to just not drink is not going to work for me. I was in way more trouble than to be able to do that. So so I placed myself under his care and protection. Now, this is remember this is like uh late 80s early 90s uh in the uh, the Basking Ridge Morristown kind of area. And at that period of time the the big book movement had not started yet. Where where you hear you hear a lot of different uh, meetings talking about big book sponsorship. They're talking about going through the steps in the big book. This was, this was not something that you were hearing about in late, the late eighties and the early nineties. It didn't exist. Uh, if there were, uh, if there were people who were paying attention and actually trying to do the steps, they were usually trying to do them out of the step book or, or something. It was, it was, uh, the, the pendulum had swung way toward fellowship at that period of time. Uh, and right now we're in the midst of basically a renaissance where a lot of people are paying attention to and getting back to the basics of recovery as they're outlined in the big book. But that didn't exist in the late 80s, at least in our area. So <clears throat> there's three things of utmost importance. If you're a really alcoholic and you're coming into Alcoholics Anonymous to find, to find a way to survive, one of them is consistency at meetings. Uh, the other is working the steps 
out of the out of the big book with a sponsor or a spiritual advisor, and the other is to be of service to carry the message to the still suffering alcoholic. If you're in real trouble with alcoholism and you don't do those three things, if you're able to stay sober, your quality of life is going to be in the toilet. That's if you're able to stay sober. Most people can't. Most real alcoholics can't. So looking back, you learn so much in hindsight. And I can look back and I can see why I survived. And it was basically because my sponsor insisted that I go to a meeting every night. His directive to me was, Chris, I want you at a meeting every night until I tell you to stop. He goes, this is not a 90 and 90 program. I'm telling you to go every night until I tell you to stop. Uh, so I did. And I did that for eight years. You know, he never did tell me to stop. He moved away before he told me to stop. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, listen, I didn't have a better plan. It wasn't like people were lining up to, you know, do things with me at night. Uh, I didn't have a better plan. So going to the meeting was, you know, the best part of the day for me. I, you know, I met, I made a lot of friends there and, you know, hooking up with those people every night was, uh, was kind of a solace to me. It was, you know, it was comforting. And, uh, and that's what I did. So that's one thing out of the three that he asked me to do. The second thing he wanted me to get involved with was service. This was a guy, this was a guy who had a service ethic. A small percentage of the people in Alcoholics Anonymous do 99% of the work. Those are the people who have that, that service ethic. And Phil did a lot of things. One of the things he did was he was a main, uh, a main volunteer at the treatment center that I went to in Morristown. It's closed its doors a long time ago, but it was CAI uh, uh, treatment center. Um, and he was he organized the volunteer work for that place. He's the one that would put on the picnic for that treatment center every year. He would bring two meetings a week up there, uh, a bridge group, which was bridging the gap between treatment and recovery. And, and uh, he was very, very involved. And he wanted me involved, too. And I had a shattered, bizarre self-esteem issue back in those days. I mean... I was I was the typical had a big ego had so much lack of self esteem I couldn't look you in the eye you know but thought I was better than you but couldn't even imagine that I could talk in a conversation with you it was a you know that bizarre alcoholic dichotomy of of insanity and it was very very tough for me to do this it was very very tough for me to share it was very very tough for me to engage in these 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 service activities. Uh, I remember this one time he asked me to uh, come out a and be a cook behind the grill at the CAI picnic. <clears throat> and he put me by the he, he, he was He was a fish food fill because he had a, a seafood restaurant and he was a seafood consultant and all this stuff. So he brought all the free seafood for this thing and he had me behind the grill cooking crab legs. You ever grill crab legs for four hours a day? I got to tell you, I smelled like a burnt crustacean. And the wind was like blowing in my eyes. My eyes were watering. And I'm like, and I'm looking over there and people are playing volleyball and, you know, drinking iced tea and, and eating hamburgers. And I'm stuck behind the grill. And I'm, I'm like six months sober and I'm thinking, this is, this, this ain't right. I, you know, I, I shouldn't have to work like this, you know, but I did it because I had a lot of respect for Phil. Now, that's those service commitments. What they were about for me was, Phil couldn't come up to me and say this, which would have been true. He couldn't really come up to, and say this to me because I had sensitive alcoholic feelings. He could not come up to me and say, Chris, you're the most selfish, self-centered, self-seeking, self-absorbed bastard I've ever met in my life. You have never done anything for anybody in your whole entire life without expecting something back as a result. Selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of your trouble, you pathetic cretin. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make you do all this stuff for fun and for free to yank you out of that self-absorbed morass that you're living in. And that's what I, but he couldn't, he couldn't say that to me. So what he would say was, Chris, I need some help at the picnic. You know? <laughs> but, but, uh, um, trust me, he understood what my real problem was. My real problem was I was pathetically self-centered. You know, and uh, and that's what we die from, folks. We don't die from drinking. 
We die from that, from that separation, that selfish and self-absorbed perspective that we walk around with thinking that, you know, we are our own planet and figuring out how everything impacts and affects us. You know, that's what we die from. Anyway, so two things I'm doing for my, for my recovery that Phil asked me to do. Meetings and service. But remember, there's no big book back then. There's no opening up the book Alcoholics Anonymous and going through the steps. It just wasn't done. People, you know, did whatever they needed to do. A lot, a lot of people became very meeting dependent back in those days. You don't see that today like you did back, back in the late 80s and early 90s. But meeting dependent. There were people with 20 years who went to 14 meetings a week. You know what I mean? And, you know, they, they'd, talk, they, they'd talk about this and they'd talk about that. And you'd, you'd ask him, you know, have you ever taken your wife out for dinner, you know? You know, you go to 14 meetings a week. Are you ever home? You know, is this really what this is about? You know, hiding out in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, but that's that, because if you don't do the recovery part, if you don't do the steps, you've got to hang on like a sumbitch. And that's going to take a gazillion meetings, a lot of service, and you're still going to be back shit crazy, you know, if you're an alcoholic. So anyway, here I am. I am a mess. I'm going to 14 meetings a week. I am uh, doing service commitments whenever and wherever my sponsor is asking me to. And I, I'm, I'm shattered. I'm self-absorbed. I am depressed. I have anxiety that's like, just freaky anxiety. I mean, I, I you know, I, I'd worry about like walking into an AA meeting. What are they thinking of about me? You know, I mean, I was just so my heightened self-absorption was like like on ten, and uh, my personal relationships were still in the toilet. I, you know, I, I was, I, you know, I'd go home at night, you know, and I'd go to make myself a drink, and there'd be like no ice in the ice cube tray. And I'd freak out. There's no ice in the ice cream tray. Don't you know I need ice? You know, and I just shared about gratitude at the, at the meeting a few minutes before. You know what I mean? I was nuts. I was nuts. And I was still spending all my money on, on things out here to put in here to try to make me feel better. I was a collector of all kinds of crap, you know. I mean, uh, I you know I came to uh, I came to an Alcoholics Anonymous with a with a monstrous comic book collection, a monstrous science fiction collection, thirty thousand LP records. I, you know, I mean, you know, just boxes and boxes of crap that I would buy to try to make me feel a little bit better inside. You know, I mean, I truly, truly was a mess. Uh, I hadn't had a, a, a decent, intimate relationship uh, in pr at least ten years or more. You know, when I when I came into to AA, and I, I was just an absolute mess. And going to meetings and doing service commitments did not help that. That they're not supposed to help that. Yes, we're supposed to learn some some wisdom teachings in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know. Like uh, the old timers were great with the one liners. The one liners are, you know, one liners are great ways to get a message across, you know. And the, these old timers were just wonderful, you know. They'd come up to you and they'd go, Kid, underneath every skirt's a slit, you know. And you'd go, like, Whoa, whoa, you know, how brilliant, you know. Someday when I get my head out of my ass, I'll see how stupid that is. But right now, I'm unrecovered. Anyway, um, anyway, I digress. Uh, so I'm a mess. I mean, emotionally, spiritually, uh, psychically. Uh, just my health is really bad. But I'm going to a lot of meetings. I'm, I'm going to a lot of meetings and I'm doing a lot of service commitments. Now, I think I shared earlier that what happened to me was uh, my buddy Radio Shack Mike came along with a stack of eight 90-minute tapes this one time. And what it was was it was, a, it was a big book workshop. And in this big book workshop, it talked about, uh, about actually going through the book Alcoholics Anonymous, following the directions in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, paying very close attention to the, like, 25 musts 
in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, where there's an exercise, stop, do the exercise, and then move on. Now, this was revolutionary to me. I'd been to a thousand meetings by this time, and I had never heard of such a thing. That's not we, how we do it in New Jersey, you know, was my first reaction. My sponsor never told me about that. I had a big book that they gave me at the rehab, and, and everybody signed it, and then I put it away and never looked at it again because I went to step meetings, you know. That's what everybody did back then. So, so this was a revolutionary concept for me. I didn't accept it right away. It was something that, uh, that I fought because it went against what my experience was. It went against what I was being taught in my Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, you know. How can this how can this be so significant if I've never heard of it? It would be like going to the hospital for 14 years with cancer and then then all of a sudden somebody giving you a set of tapes that talks about chemotherapy. You'd be like, "What? You know, why haven't I heard about this before? This can't possibly work, you know." And that that was my initial reaction. Well, some things happened. Some things happened uh, to me and uh I went I went through a a period of uh of time where uh where where the crap hit the fan, you know, if uh, if you hang around here long enough, there's you're going to have a time in the barrel. It happens to all of us. And what that looks like, it's like two or three or four or five big things in your life: deaths, loss of jobs, you know, uh, uh, problems with cars, you know, whatever. You you put them all together, and they hit you one right after another. And it was about, I mean, it just knocked the wind out of me. It was gonna it was gonna take me out. I you know this this depression that I was in. So I remember listening to these tapes and uh, saying, you know, the message in these tapes had haunted me. I listened to them like I listened to anything for, for, uh, for entertainment, you know, on, a, on my ride to work. But these tapes were very, very deep and profound, and they had, uh, they had a truth, like a rock-solid truth that haunted me. I wanted to say, you know, these guys from Arkansas don't know anything. You know, this isn't the way we do it. But um, they they talked with such authority and they made such sense that, you know, this the, their message haunted me. So when I got to a point where I was at an emotional bottom, uh, uh, pitifully and incomprehensibly demoralized, I pulled out these tapes and I started listening to them. And I, and I went through the 12 steps uh, following their guidance. And as I uh, as I did this, I, I was kind of unaware of what was going on at the time. But basically, what happened to me was I started to recover from alcoholism. Uh, that's the whole point of the twelve steps: awakening your spirit to the point where you're no longer that self-absorbed, self-seeking individual. Your your spirit has awakened, and you're you're you know you're conscious now of really what uh the whole plan is here and uh you know that's uh that's what was going on with me as I was going through these steps now i uh, i had sponsored uh prior to this um uh, i actually started sponsoring you know with about 7 or 8 months um and there was a number of guys that uh that i had for one reason or another, I guess because I kind of came off pretty crazy back in those days, I would get crazy people asking me to sponsor them. You know, one lunatic after another would, would ask me. And, and my, my uh, automatic response, because I still kind of had self-esteem issues, was yes. You want me to sponsor you? Yes. Okay. Now, what's your problem? Which are, that's the wrong way to ask those, uh, those questions, by the way. Anyway, um, Anyway, I had a whole bunch of uh, guys that were drinking on me, you know. These were sponsors that were making me look bad because they were drinking, you know, and they were, they were running around uh, hitting on the new women and causing all kinds of trouble in, in, the, uh, in the meetings. And people would come to me and say, hey, is this guy yours, you know? <laughs> yeah, I'll talk to him, you know. And uh, so uh, I had gone... I, about a year earlier, I'd taken myself kind of through the big book, and again, a lot of that that self-centered fear, a lot of that depression and anxiety was being lifted because of the process of the steps. I was feeling a lot better about myself. I was worrying about stuff a lot less. And uh, it, I came to the conclusion that, you know, it, it, this really has worked for me. I know what I'll do. I'll bring, this, I'll bring these guys over to my house. 
uh, and I'll take them through the book, and we'll, bo- we'll both go through the book. I'll start at page one, we'll read the whole book, we'll do all the exercises, and that's how I'm going to sponsor from now on. And that was uh, sometime in the early 90s. And I started to do that. And uh, I learned a couple of very, very significant lessons. One of them was, I kind of felt like I can't ask anybody to do something that I'm not willing to do myself. So the first half a dozen guys I took through the steps, I went through the steps myself too, again, you know. Uh, so in a very, very short period of time, I, I, worked, I worked through the steps a number of times. Um, that helped me a lot. That's one of the things that I learned. Again, um, you're, you're so, if you're an alcoholic, you're so sick, you don't even know you're sick. You don't know how sick you are. You're minimized. And then you start to get better. And then you realize that you're sick, but you're not as sick as those people over there. You know, and then, and then finally, finally, you get to a point where you realize you're sick and you're, you're sick just like everybody else. You're just at a different place on the continuum, you know. And, um, uh, and so I, I'm bringing these guys over. And the, here's the second thing that I learned. The second thing I learned was the, the guys who went through this with me, who didn't balk, there were people who, you know, saw the fourth and fifth step as an overreaction. There were certainly people that saw the eighth and the ninth step as something that they didn't feel comfortable with. And what would happen is they would extricate themselves. They'd slowly drift away. The people who didn't go through the steps. And they're all gone. There's nobody left who said, you know, Chris, I'm not doing the fourth step. And they're still in AA. You know, no way. They're all gone. Every single one of the guys that went through the steps with me are still around. And, you know, they're celebrating 17, 18, 19 years now. Every single one of them. Uh, And they're all sponsoring people. And you look at their quality of life and it's amazing. I mean, they are, they've got growing pains just like the rest of us. You know, things aren't perfect. But my God, are they experiencing and appreciating life. You know, however that's coming at them. And, uh, you know, I, I still got these, these are, these are friends of mine that would take a bullet for me. You know, they're still very, 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 very close guys. And, uh, I, you know, I didn't do any of that out of a sense of virtue. It wasn't like to be like a better AA. I, I did it all out of kind of a sense of desperation and a sense of not wanting to feel bad anymore and a sense of not wanting to let my guys down. If I'm sponsoring somebody, I didn't want to let them down. If I could help them not drink, I, I, I took that responsibility seriously. So this is how I, I learned how to, how to sponsor. Now, sometime in the late uh, 1990s or whatever, I started to study a little bit of Alcoholics Anonymous history. Uh, nothing like Bill over here. Bill, Bill is uh, quite possibly one of the top five AA historians on this planet. Uh, I mean, he, he knows what Ebby Thatcher was wearing, you know, when he showed up at Bill's house. Uh, but I did study some of the early AAs, and I got a hold of some of the early tapes of the first 100, and I studied the Oxford group, and I studied Sam Shoemaker and, you know, Father Ed Dowling and a number of these other people that were very influential in the formation and growth of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, uh, here's, here's what I came, here's some of the conclusions that I've come to. In the early days of AA, this is what it would look like if you were an AA member. On Monday night, you'd go to a meeting and meet with the rest of your, your, your guys, you know, and you'd get together and you'd strategize about finding other alcoholics. That's all it was about. It was about, hey, who are you working with and where are you going to find more guys to work with? That would be Monday night. Tuesday night, everybody would split up. Some people would go to the, to the loony bins. Some people would go to the jails or the detoxes. Wednesday night, they'd go to the hospitals, they, they'd go to over here to Greystone, or, you know, they'd go talk to doctors or lawyers or judges. All throughout the week, they would go and look for prospects. A prospect is you try to dig for prospects. You try to find people who may want what you have to offer, who may be alcoholic and may want to get over it. And you do that out there. You don't do it in the meetings. You do it out there. Most of your work is out there. And that's what the first five or ten years of Alcoholics Anonymous looked like. You know, what, what, uh, it was a, it was a recovery program. It was finding people to take through the 12 steps. 
Um, finding people who wanted what you have to offer. What you have to offer is not meetings. What you have to offer is the 12 steps, the recovery process, the, um, uh, the inventory, the, the uh, confession, the restitution, the prayer and meditation, the working with other people. All, all of that came out of the Oxford group and uh, Sam Shoemaker and a number of other people. And that was the business that you were about as an AA member, finding people who might want to do that. And they went through a lot of people. You'd go through 10, 20 people before you'd find somebody who's receptive. And when, when you found somebody that was receptive, they were now a protege. They went from being a prospect to a protege. Your protege was somebody who was taking the steps with you, who you were giving spiritual guidance to about how to develop their relationship with God. And if they were a prospect, you could invite them into the meetings. You know, back in the day, they didn't just let anybody in the meetings. If you weren't about the business of working the steps, you know, you're not, you don't have an honest desire to stop drinking. And, uh, you know, you couldn't just wander into an AA meeting in the first 10 years. You know, you had to show that you meant business. Now, uh, so I'm learning all this. And then I'm thinking to these, uh, to these Joe and Charlie tapes, and I'm thinking, well, what the hell? What the hell has happened in Alcoholics Anonymous? We went from a, a program of recovery with a sport fellowship to a fellowship of sobriety. Because that's, that's what it was like when I came in. It was a fellowship of sobriety. Hey, keep sit, just stay sober. Just don't drink no matter what. Even if your ass falls off. Just think the drink through. Simple, keep it simple, stupid. Hang on. Let go. You know, I mean, that, that's, that's all it was. And, and, uh, you know, go to the meetings, go to the meetings, go to the meetings, make coffee, go to the meetings, go to the meetings. How the hell did we get from people that were witnessing to the power of God to shoving people into the meetings? What happened? So I started to look into that a little bit. And, you know, there's a number of things. There's a number of things that, uh, that have contributed to, uh, uh, to the change in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, many things. I think that when the step book came out, I think that that detoured us uh, away from our primary purpose. I think when alcoholism became uh, uh, became uh, a, a disease in 1956 by the American Medical Society, I think that that uh, m- made opportunities out there for every kind of wackadoo treatment program you've ever seen. I, anybody in here sober uh, before 1993, you remember all the treatment centers? Remember all the treatment centers? You could shake a stick without hitting the happy hills somewhere, you know. And some of them were wacko with, with what, what they did. Just wacky. They would hire patients who just got sober and make them counselors. I mean, it was just the craziest crap you ever seen in your life. And they were everywhere. And uh, I think that helped to, uh, to throw a couple of torpedoes into Alcoholics Anonymous and what Alcoholics Anonymous was about. And you know, I, I also think that um, I also think that some of the AA promotion, you know, some of the stuff that that, uh, that comes out in New York, if, if you pay attention really closely to what uh, General Service does and their initiatives, you'll see that they're more about membership numbers, they're more about uh, quantity than they are about quality. So uh, so what will happen is is that they want to send this message out that the more the merrier. Do it any way you want to do it. Just come on in. And that's great for the revenue, uh, but it's not necessarily good for, uh, uh, good for holding on to a primary purpose and holding on to a recovery process really tightly. If you open up the door so wide to let every kind of thing in in the world... You're going to dilute. Uh, you're going to dilute this, and that's kind of what happened uh, over the, over the decades in Alcoholics Anonymous. We had become diluted, and that's a, that's really a shame because uh, I I've been around a long time, I've gone to a lot of meetings. I know a lot of people in recovery, and I have to tell you that uh, the people that I see that have recovered, that really have that awakened spirit, that have that the, you know, the promises have come true for them. The, you know, they, they don't wish to uh, shut the door on the past nor regret it. They know a new freedom and a new happiness. You know, the best years of their lives are ahead of them. You know, God is doing for them what they cannot do for themselves. Those people, 
uh, they always have a step process in their history. The people that go back out always don't. You know what I mean? Uh, listen, lots of people, lots of people cycle through Alcoholics Anonymous. Two years ago, in uh, in the Grapevine magazine, they went back to the gray pages. Uh, the gray pages were information from the professional uh, alcoholism and, and drug treatment industry, and, and they like to put the gray pages in there just to educate us on, you know, what's going on out there in in the medical world that, that relates to us. And every once in a while you'll get statistics and you get studies that'll, that are done, like about us. And uh, uh, this one study was about uh, how long people have been in the meetings. And there was an independent group of people who did this survey. And they came up with some staggering survey numbers. Uh, they came up with the fact that 45% of the people, and this is all 12-step programs, it's not just AA. AA, I'm sure, would have better statistics, but they went to all these different 12-step fellowships and interviewed people coming in and out of the door, and they found that 45% of the people going into 12-step meetings have less than two months sober. 45%. Now, is anybody else horrified by that besides myself? I mean, what does that say about our effectiveness, you know? And for a long time, I was also uh, also uh, aligned with and hooked into the professional uh, alcoholism and drug treatment community. I, uh, I, I wasn't a counselor or anything like that. Um, uh, I don't have the patience for that. But what I what I was doing was I, I was doing some media work, and I got a chance to meet a lot of people who are professional uh, drug and alcohol treatment people. They own the rehabs, and they write the the articles for for the DSM fours, and you know they they uh, they do the scholarly articles, and they put on the symposiums and all stuff. And I met I met these guys. Now that led me into doing some. Uh, some LinkedIn uh, and some uh, some some Facebook blog stuff. I got involved in in some blogs, and this guy went a, went after me one time on the blog. I'm very pro 12 step because it's really my own experience. I mean, if you've got another way out there, okay, show me three million people it's worked for. All right, otherwise I don't want to hear about. It. And because uh, everybody's got, you know, there's people who have equine therapy. You don't need to go to AA. Just work with the horses. I mean, everybody's got a, got an idea. They do. And uh, and they, they're going to make money off you, too, while they do it. And, and the, the world is just populated with these knuckleheads. Uh, and, you know, and this one guy goes after me. He's a non-12-step clinical psychologist, okay? And... You know he he doesn't send people to AA, and uh, you know and he and he let me know why. He goes, do you know that AA statistics are six percent? He goes, I can get better. I can get better results offering placebos. That was his that was his comment to me. Six percent. Now, if you were to stand out by this door for the next ten years and survey every single person that's walking through here you'll probably find that only 6% of the people that are that's in this room tonight are going to be here in 10 years. Okay, I'll give you that. However, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. That is still true. That is still true. The people who thoroughly followed the path that I laid out for them and the steps, they're all still here. They're all still here. The people that didn't are gone. Now, <clears throat> I had to rebut this guy, okay, because I may be recovered, but I'm still going to win arguments. Uh, and how I rebutted this guy was, was like this. I go, okay, let's say you have cancer, all right? You've got pancreatic cancer, and you go to the hospital, you go to the hospital, and you sit in the waiting room, and you talk about, oh, you talk with other people in the waiting room about your cancer treatment. And they're in for cancer. Now let's talk about our cancer treatment. Let's talk about our cancer treatment. And then you go home. And you come back the next day and you sit in the waiting room and you talk about cancer, your cancer treatment again. Well, what kind of treatment are you going to have? Oh, I, I'm thinking about having this. But you never go in for the operation. Should the hospital be held accountable to your poor statistics? 
In other words, is it the hospital's fault if you die of cancer? You went to the hospital, but you didn't follow their suggestions. You didn't go in for the operation. The same thing happens in Alcoholics Anonymous today. Lots of people come in and sit in the waiting room. We sit in the waiting room and we talk about the steps and we philosophize about the steps and then we read about this. We share about the steps. We don't do them. Now, can Alcoholics Anonymous really be held accountable if you go out and drink? Did AA really not work? Did that hospital really not work? Because rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Right after it says that, it lays out the path. So if you're not about that path, you, you, you can't be part of the rarely. You're not, you're not, uh, you know, you're not allowed to be part of the rarely unless you follow the path. So Alcoholics Anonymous has changed. Now there's a renaissance going on now, uh, that's all about following the path, getting back to following the path. We spent decades away from this, you know, decades away from this. And now there are groups that are talking about this, that are bringing it back into conversation. There are people who are starting to sponsor this way again. And this is, listen, this is all to the good. Does every meeting have to be like a big book meeting? I, I don't, I don't believe so. I really don't. Uh, but I think that each area should have a couple of uh, literature based, solution based meetings because Part of our recovery process is going to, is going to, we're going to need to encourage each other to do this. The steps are not easy. You know, the steps are not easy. Uh, when you get to steps eight and steps nine, you know, that's, that's a big playground. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, it takes, it takes a lot of encouragement. So we need to, we need to be about the business of helping each other. Now, in the book Alcoholics Anonymous is a great chapter. It's called Working with Others. For many, many years, <clears throat> How I was sponsoring, even when I was starting to take people through the steps, I was winging it. I really was. I was winging it. I was, uh, I was listening to a lot of the oral tradition uh, in the meetings. Uh, people who sponsored, I was, you know, perking up when they were talking about their sponsorship style and everything. And uh, what, I realized, what I realized one day was when I was reading the chapter Working with Others is, that's how you're supposed to work with others. Uh, duh. You know, I mean... So, so often, I'm the type of alcoholic, so often the truth will be right there in front of me, and in three years, uh, you know, I, and then all of a sudden I'll say, hey, I just discovered the truth. You know, well, it's been in front of you for three years. That's just, that's just me. Now, in the chapter working with others, uh, when I, when I first looked at it, I, you know, I thought, wow, this is hardcore. You know, this is really is hardcore. Compared to the alcoholics, the liberal alcoholics anonymous I, you know, I came to in, in the late 80s. Yes, it was hardcore. Yes, it was hardcore. Because we didn't tell anybody what to do. You, you can't tell anybody what to do in AA. Uh, you know, I don't know where, all this, all this crap came from bad treatment centers, by the way. All, all these little slogans and everything. Anyway, uh, Anyway, in, this, in the chapter, Working with Others, it talks about finding a prospect. And then it talks about the first visit. Then it talks about the second visit. On the first visit, leave the person the book. The book Alcoholics Anonymous. Ask them to read it. You know, if, they, if they're capable of reading. Ask them to read it in the interval between your first and your sec visit, second visit. On the second visit back, you know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to ask them, well, are you willing to go to those links? What links? Are you willing to go to any links? What links? The links in the book. You read the book. Are you willing to do that? And if they say no or they have any other answer except an unqualified yes, you're basically supposed to say, well, here's my phone number. You know, I really only know one way to recover from alcoholism. Here's my phone number. Give me a call if you ever mean business. Bye-bye. Now, you know, when I was first exposed to this method of, uh, of sponsorship, of, of mentoring someone uh, through the steps, I, you know, I was pretty horrified. I thought you had to trick them. I thought, you know, you had to like reel them in and, you know, land them over the course of a couple of months and manipulate them and trick them into doing good things for themselves. But that's really not the case. I have had, I have had my, my a lot of experience with a lot of different uh, different people. 
And I have wasted an exorbitant amount of time working with people who really weren't willing. They, why they asked me to sponsor them, I don't know. Maybe it was maybe it was just for me to co-sign their crap. Maybe it was you know if they could say, "Well, oh, Chris is my sponsor," people would leave him alone. You know, maybe maybe they were inspired at a meeting, and you know they, boy, this sounds really great, and they asked me. But there was really there was really not really a lot of follow through. And these individuals wanted me to be one thing. They wanted me to be their drama coach. Okay? They wanted to be able to call me up every time they got in the jackpot. Oh, you wouldn't believe what happened to me this time. Well, yes, unfortunately, I do believe what happened to you this time because you're an idiot. You know what I mean? And you are so your own worst enemy. And the the first mistake you made this morning when you woke up was start to think. You know what I mean? Uh, and I, I mean, I, I, for the longest time I was, I was the drama coach. Middle of the night, phone calls, you know, you know, I just need to talk. Well, I'm here for you, you know. And, and I would, hour after hour, these phone calls. Most of these morons ended up sliming their way out of Alcoholics Anonymous and disappearing anyway because they weren't about the business of recovery. You can't recover by sharing, you know, and that's all they wanted to do. And uh, and they wait that all that you know. So you spend time. Your daughter meets them, you know. It's it's bummed out, Bob Danielle. This is bummed out, Bob. And you know, you go to the park together, and you go to Durney Park, and into New York City, and then they slime their way out of all Alcoholics Anonymous, and then your daughter is going, "Where's bummed out, Bob, Daddy?" Well, sweetheart, he's a loser, you know, and he slimed his way out of Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, this happened to me for years. So slowly, I started to pay a little bit of attention to this chapter working with others. This chapter working with others will save you all of that heartache of sponsoring people who are on the half measure program. It really will because it's hardcore. It basically, it, you know, it, it basically lays it out. Okay, I've got to qualify the individual. I got to be sure he's an alcoholic. I have to be, not them. I have to be. If I'm going to work with them, and if I'm not sure, I don't need to work with them. If I'm sure and they want to, they want help. I have to work with them, you know. But I don't need to work with somebody that's not an alcoholic. Have I been helpful over the years? Have I even taken people through the steps who weren't alcoholic, who were drug addicts, or whatever? Absolutely. But I, as an Alcoholics Anonymous member, I'm, it's not incumbent upon me to do that. If they're a heavy drinker or disco drunk or something, you know, they don't need me. They can go and share somewhere, and they'll be fine. If, however, they're alcoholic, uh, they're going to have to be about the business of recovery or they're going to slowly die an inch at a time because that's, that's what happens to us. Anyway, so my first visit, qualify the individual. Talk a little bit about my story. Allow the individual to tell me about his story. Try to identify because that's what happened with Bill and Dr. Bob. Dr. Bob said when he talked to Bill Wilson, it was the first time in his life he ever talked to anybody who understood the drinking game. It's the first time. And he was only going to give this bird 15 minutes, and they spent like seven hours together, and he moved them into his house the next day. Moved, moved the, uh, Bill Wilson into the house the next day. Because here was somebody who identified. That identification is powerful. That's why we're here. So in my, in my initial contact with the alcoholic, I need to spend that time. I need to talk about drinking. I don't just say yes in an AA meeting. Somebody come up to me, hey, Chris, I need a sponsor. Are you available? I don't just say yes. I'm not supposed to. I'm supposed to meet with the individual and become convinced that they're an alcoholic. And leave them the book. Has anybody ever asked you, are you willing to go to any lengths? And then not giving you the dignity of even understanding what the hell that means. What is any lengths? You know? You know, you dress me up in a diaper and march me down Fifth Avenue? I mean, you know, what, what, what the hell is any lengths? Do I gotta wash your car every Saturday? Well, what does that mean? You know, I never could get any answers from, from these mutton brains back in the day. Any lengths, the only way you're gonna understand what any lengths is, is if somebody Shows you the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Alco the book Alcoholics Anonymous is any lengths. Are you willing to go to these lengths? In here, the, the steps. Read Bill's story. 
First eight pages of Bill's story is the tragedy. The second eight pages is the recovery. Read the second eight pages of Bill Wilson's story and tell me if you're, if you're willing to do that. Because that's what recovery looks like. Now, um, I gotta admit to you, not every single person that asks me today ends up being sponsored by me. Uh, but I don't waste time anymore with people that are not willing. You're not supposed to. The book Alcoholics Anonymous says your time as a recovered alcoholic is extremely valuable. Never waste time working with someone who is not going to work with you. There are, there, are, there are people out there that are much more desperate and willing to work with you. So cut. Cut the ties. Don't work with these people who are, who are barely willing to get to meetings, let alone go through the steps. We're not supposed to bother with them. Are they welcome in the meetings? Absolutely. This is an open fellowship. Uh, do, you know, do they deserve to work with us? No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. So in the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, it explains, it, it explains how you are to show the individual how to go through the steps. You know how to go through the steps because you've just had this experience. This leads me to believe that if you haven't gone through the, the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to be an effective sponsor or mentor or show people how to go through the steps. How, do you, how are you going to show them how to, how to do amends if you never did them yourself? How are, how are you going to do that? You know, it's, it's going to be an empty intellectual exercise instead of a sharing of experience, strength, and hope. So uh, I believe it's incumbent upon us as, as sponsors to have our own experience. Now, you know, uh, I believe that there's a lot of latitude in the steps. I know that none of us do them perfectly. I know that there are, each of us has personalities that have uh, specific challenges where it comes to some of these steps. I don't think we get an A, B, or a C in how we go through the steps. I think it's pass fail. You know what I mean? And if you do enough work, you're you're gonna you're gonna pass and you're gonna recover. So again, I'm not uh, I'm not a stickler for the the me mechanics. I'm more interested in the in the spirit of these exercises. And there is, you know, if somebody has a four column or something, or somebody's got a five column, or they've got a four column fear and only a two column. I don't really care uh, about that stuff. I look for thoroughness and I look for honesty, you know, when the people are, are, are going through the steps. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of latitude. And many of us have already a connection to the grace of God. And it's that grace that kind of intuits through us how to do some of these step processes. You know, I've seen so many people come to so many profound conclusions about their life going through the fourth and the fifth step. I've so, seen so many lights come on in the eyes of dead people when they've gone through the eighth and the ninth step. And I've seen so, much, so many people improve dramatically their quality of life you know, praying and meditating and carrying the message to, to other people that you have absolutely no idea. The miracles, there are miracles among us in Alcoholics Anonymous, but you have to work for these miracles. You know, uh, there's, a, there's a religious uh, controversy out there, uh, and ha there has been for hundreds of years now. One of them is justification through faith. You know, you are saved through faith alone. And then there's a, there's a book of James, which the Alcoholics Anonymous, all the early Alcoholics Anonymous members used as, you know, uh, a sounding board for their meetings, where it basically says, uh, faith without works is dead. I believe that if you're an average person, you can be saved through faith alone. I have no argument about that. I will tell you this, if you're an alcoholic, you are not going to recover by belief alone. You're going to have to recover by work. The Alcoholics Anonymous and recovery is not a spiritual, uh, I'm sorry, not an intellectual uh, 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 endeavor. It's not. It's not about learning more. You know, I do a lot of big book workshops in a lot of different areas. And one of the things I always qualify in these big book workshops are, if you're here just to learn or just to sound, sound better, you know, share better at meetings, that's all well and fine. But don't expect to get a lot out of that. Um, if, if, however, you're going to this big book workshop uh, because you want to uh, 
uh, gain some knowledge about some things that you can turn into your own experience, some some practical application, and learn you know learn uh, the mechanics so that you can actually go out and do it. That's a whole other thing. You're going to have a whole other experience with it that way, because it's through the doing. It's not through the thinking or knowing. It's through the doing that we recover. And uh, you know I. I you know, that's been my experience and my experience with just a, a ton of people in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, one of the things that I believe very strongly in, and it's kind of a call to action, and I'll, I'll, I'll end with this, is if every single one of us in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous would take very, very seriously what the chapter working with others says and just find two people to get through the steps in the next year, in 10 years, alcoholism will be over. You know what I mean? Exponentially, it will... That, this is how it spread in the early days. In the early days, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous doubled in size like every, every couple of years, if not less. And it's because of working one-on-one -on -one with the alcoholic and showing them a recovery experience. We don't do that much anymore. We've, we've become a lazy, meeting-dependent kind of a fellowship. You know, not, certainly not the people in this room. I, I'm uh, not talking about us. In general. And, uh, and if we could just get back to the power uh, of the actions that they talk about in the chapter working with others, uh, we could really, really save some lives out there. There's, uh, there's no doubt. I was on, uh, I was on a head-on collision with ruin, death and ruin uh, in the late 80s. Uh, I, I, my alcoholism had progressed to the point where I was literally poisoning myself to death with hard liquor every single night. Um, Going, you know, alcohol poisoning uh, myself every single night, and I could not stop. But that that sickness, that physical sickness, wasn't even the worst part. It was the psychic and emotional trauma that I was putting myself through. Now, now think about this: the recovery process for alcoholism. If all it did was offer us separation from alcohol, it would be worth it. But it offers so much more. The recovery process offers so much more. It offers soundness of mind. It offers an awakened spirit. You know, uh, being able to uh, intuitively know the right way to act, coming to the right thoughts, having compassion, having compassion. What uh, what recovery has offered me is. I was able to move my structure off of a foundation built on selfishness, self-centeredness, self-seeking, and self-absorption to a new foundation. And that new foundation is built on love, service, and compassion. And that's a complete shift in perception. It's a complete new perspective. It's looking at the world with a complete new pair of glasses. And it's way more. Way, I am so grateful because it's way more than I think I, I deserve the way I was living at the end. So alcoholism is an aggressive, progressively fatal illness. It kills you. And before you even know it, you have it. It kills you. But if you're lucky enough to be part of the, part of the, uh, the crew that actually recovers from it, there are some serious promises uh, that are attached to it. Knowing that new freedom, knowing that new happiness, under, understanding what serenity means, being, being able to be alone at perfect peace and ease, not having to fight alcohol anymore, not having to fight anything anymore. These are incredible promises, but we need to work for them. And again, uh, uh, I've had a really great time uh, doing the talks here at this workshop, uh, uh, the Montclair area has really got some stuff going on. Uh, I love coming down here. I've got some good friends in this area, and uh, I want to I want to thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So, if you'd like to help us be self supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.